Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Ways and Means Committee. There's a pretty full agenda. And of course, uh, I'm chaired by our, our, I'm John Quincy, the chair of the committee. And I'm joined today by uh, committee members, uh, Yang, uh, Paolo Masano, uh, Council Vice President Glidden, uh, Bender, and Council Member uh, Andrew Johnson. And I've also been joined, uh, probably not for the first part of the session, but for the discussion topics by uh, Council President Johnson. I see Council Member uh, Connell, uh, Council Member Reich, and anybody else? More may be coming in. Of course, I want to acknowledge uh, President Liz Walensky from the Park Board also with us today. So let's, let's see what we can get on with our uh, consent. Oh, I'm sorry. The first item is a public hearing. Sorry. Oh, I didn't. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I see Superintendent Jane Miller is also with us. We expect to hear from at the next, uh, in the next few moments. So we'll begin, I think it's the uh, first, is uh, considering a mayoral reappointment of Ellen McVeigh uh, for seat one of the Civil Service Commission appointment. And this is a public hearing on that. I don't know if there's a, uh, a report coming from any staff on this. Is there? Not seeing any. So I'm just going to open the uh, uh, public hearing for the reappointment of Ms. McVeigh. Anyone to speak on that? Anyone? Anyone? Not seeing anyone. I'll close the public hearing and I'll move that action as Civil Service Commission appointment uh, reappointment uh, from the mayor of Ellen McVeigh for that seat one uh, with a uh, period ending uh, February 28th, 2019. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed, that item carries. And we'll move on to the consent agenda really quickly. Uh, this is the first number of items is a uh, uh, legal settlement. Uh, we'll get to House Member Almasano's item. First is a uh, legal settlement. The second item number three on the agenda is also a legal settlement. We have a legal settlement with Nath Nath Nathaniel Brown versus the city, a legal settlement with uh, Anthony Leon versus the city, a legal settlement with Gary Peterson versus the city, and a legal settlement with Patience Dirks uh, versus the city. Uh, item number eight on the agenda is the uh, city coordinator's office brings forward a couple of items. One is a contract with the Center for Energy and Environment for home visits and energy efficiency loans. Item number nine is a request for a proposal from a human capital consulting services. Item number 10 comes from the communications department. This is a gift acceptance for donated billboard display time from Clear Channel Outdoor. Item number 11 is from the convention center. This is a bid uh, by Electrical Co Corporation for exterior dome light replacement project. Uh, Finance and Property Services brings forward the first quarter gift acceptance uh, resolution. Information Technology Department brings forward two items. One is the uh, request for proposal for solid waste information system. And uh, item number 14 is a contract amendment with Morpho Track Saffron uh, for latent station fingerprint uh, system support. The Executive Committee brings forward uh, several actions. One is the appointed position for Deputy Director of Fire Inspection Services. Uh, item number 16 is appointed officials salary administration plan modifications. 17 are the performance appraisal policy revisions. 18 is the 2016 politically appointed compensation plans. Uh, 19, the uh, 2016 non-represented employee salary schedule. Uh, item number 20 is a collective bargaining agreement. Uh, this is for the Emergency Communication Center su Supervisors Bargaining Unit. The Community Developments and Regulatory Services Committee brings forward the Plymouth Stevens House bond issuance. Uh, item number 22 is uh, housing opportunities for persons with AIDS. It's a HOPWA grant funding priorities report. 23 is a contract with SMG for traffic control services at U.S. Bank Stadium. 24 environmental grant funding applications for the spring 2016 Brownfield grant round. Uh, item number 25 are the Metropolitan Council Livable Communities Demonstration Account, LCDA. Uh, Livable Communities Demonstration Account for their TOD grant program applications. And we have from the Health, Environment, and Community Engagement Committees, the grant for Minnesota Department of Human Services for tobacco compliance. 27 is a grant for Minnesota Department of Health for lead poisoning intervention. 28 contracts for parent support and education services. 
from the Public Safety Civil Rights Emergency Management Committee, we have travel-related cost donations acceptance for the police chief to attend the 2016 Harvard Public Policy Safety Summit. Transportation and Public Works Committee brings forward the cooperative agreement with Minnesota Ballpark Authority for pedestrian lighting on 6th Avenue. The uh, 2016 municipal off-street parking rates. The 32 is the agreement with Santa Masters for graffiti abatement services. And number 33 is the bid for Nicollet Mall Sanitary Sewer Reconstruction Phase 2. Uh, before we get to the discussion items, uh, I'm happy to call on Council Member Palmasano for uh, a separate item. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Council Member Palmasano. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'd like to move to amend the agenda to add the new item that's in front of you. Uh, that's item number 36. 37, a contract amendment for ongoing outside audit assistance. Um, just to briefly explain, um, internal audit has been working with departments on different needs and at times require skills that go beyond our small shops area of expertise. Um, this particular vendor waypoint has been a vendor for one element of our 2016 approved audit work plan. Um, and after a department came to our internal audit and asked for um, help with a different, more emergent need, um, we are realizing that this vendor we're already working with is really the local niche, um, uh, uh, has those skills, and we would like to not have to interrupt our service with them when we figure out the details of that plan. So um, I ask to amend that contract and allow us to um, go above the typical cap for contracts, uh, also knowing that this will be eventually charged back to the departments that are requesting it. Okay. Thank you. We'll consider that uh, item moved as part of our consent agenda. I'm going to move the other uh, two through items uh, two through 23 on the consent agenda. And I know Councilmember Johnson had a question or a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is related to the legal settlements. I noticed that we have about half a million dollars worth of uh, legal settlements before us, including one for $315,000. I'm wondering if the uh, city attorney's office representative uh, has it is able to put any kind of context on that. It does seem a little uh, high for what usually comes through this committee from what I've seen. And so I just think having some more information would be helpful. Um, Ms. Trammell, I'm not sure exactly which item we're talking about. I just don't have it in front of me. Uh, Chair Quincy and Council Member you see Andrew Johnson, I'm sorry. I believe you're talking about item number six. Yeah, item number six. That's and I, I do not have that information with me. I would know only what's in the RCA. I could uh, make inquiries to have the attorney who handled it uh, brief you on it if you would like. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, no, I guess that's fine. I'm happy to chat after committee too, but I would like more information on items number five and item number six. Uh, and you know what, item number two as well, it just seems uh, to be a little bit more than what we usually have come through this committee. Council Vice President Glidden. I just, <clears throat> and I, I appreciate Council Member um, Johnson asking those questions. I actually, as I was preparing this uh, afternoon for the meeting, I noted those as well. I just wanted to say on five and six, I'll just note that those are workers' comp related issues. It said in the RCA, which <clears throat> is sometimes a little bit different set of questions than comes in some of the other types of liability issues. So I just wanted to, to note that uh, for those who are watching. Good questions. Very important to point out. Thank you for that. Good. Council Member Yang. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, this is just a uh, quick little comments. Um, for item number three, um, my understanding is that the attorneys listed might be uh, incorrect. Um, I I think the intention is supposed to be De Leon and Nestor, not uh, Dion and Nestor. Uh, so it's just a minor correction. On item number three. Okay. Again, that looks like something we should probably uh, check from the city attorney's office. So let's, is that is it something we should follow up with to make sure that technically correct on Friday? Yeah, that, that would be great. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, and the, the point being that uh, I, I think the attorneys listed or the law firm listed should be De Leon and Nestor, not Dion and Nestor. Okay. That sounds like a, a technical thing. I think we can uh, probably correct that on Friday, um, but uh, that doesn't uh, change the underlying uh, activity here, which is the approval of the settlement. So uh, on all those items, 
as well as the addition of Councilmember Paul Masano's. Uh, further questions, comments? Not seeing any. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed. Those items all carry. So we can go now to our um, first item here on the discussion, which is uh, the re referred from the Committee of the Whole. We're taking up the topic of the 20-year uh, uh, park uh, neighborhood park plan resolution. Um, and I also see an item here, and there's a number of people in the audience probably related to the bid for Nicollet Mall reconstruction. Is that correct? Are you guys here for that? Can we go ahead and, if it's okay with uh, council members, so other people can do that, can we take that item up first? We're not seeing any objections to that. So item number three, the bid for Nicollet Mall reconstruction. Mr. Elwood, are you leading us through that discussion and presentation? Just wanted to note, this is an item that came up um, rather late in our <coughs> planning cycle, so we were not able to dispense this at the Transportation and Public Works Committee. So we've decided to take it right up here in this uh, committee uh, as it relates to the, uh, the funding mechanisms for the bids for Nicollet Mall reconstruction, something that the uh, Transportation Public Works Committee and the Council has already taken action on. So this just effectuates those, those changes with the new bids. So just wanted to highlight that for Council Member Reich. If you'd like to add anything either before or after Mr. Elwood's remarks, you're certainly welcome. Okay, Mr. Elwood, go ahead. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Don Elwood. I'm the Director of Transportation Engineering Design for Minneapolis Public Works. The action item before you today is to approve the Nicollet Mall bid for construction. This portion is the roadway and streetscape. Um, this is for the main project to reconstruct Nicollet Mall. The low bid is with Meyer Contracting Incorporated and the bid amount is 28 million. $973,145.05. I have a short presentation today to walk us through a little bit of project history, scope, schedule, and budget, what our bid alternatives are, what we'll be constructing, and what we can do to look ahead. In 2012 and 2013, the Nicomal Implementation Committee was established, and we selected James Corner Field Operation to lead us through the design. December 2013 into June of 2014, the concept design was approved, and the city of Minneapolis secured the grant funding, 21.5 million from the state, and also applied 3.5 million of city funds. December of 2014 to May of 2015, we had the preliminary design completed, and we also approved the $25 million special assessments. At that point, we had a fully funded project at $50 million. In October to December of 2015, the contract documents were completed and I put the project out for bid. That project bid opening was in December of 2015. At that time, I had one single bid and that bid surpassed my ability to deliver the project. And the bid was rejected. At that point, we did a redesign and repackaged and streamlined this project. We split the project into three bid packs. We changed the concrete pavers to in place, cast in place concrete. We modified some interim completion dates and we extended the project timeline. In January to April of 2016, that, that project was rebid and we opened that, the bids for that project on April 5th. Project scope, um, the Nickel Mall project is a full reconstruction from Washington to Grant, building phase to building phase. It includes relocation of public art and relocation of utilities. Our schedule uh, puts us to completion of fall of 2017. And this slide, uh, I have this slide up here to give us a concept of where we are in the overall project. We've spent a lot of time since 2013 to get us to where we are at today, and then we will go into construction. <coughs> construction budget for the project, we have a base bid for roadway with alternatives at $28.9 million. Bid pack number two is for trees and plantings. That bid has been awarded and we have a signed contract in place at 608,000. And bid pack number three, which is pending, is for the street furniture at approximately 500,000. When I add in scope adjustments and contingencies and the public art, I have a construction project budget at 37.2 million. 
My overall project budget is at 50 million. That was estimated in 2013. We had roughly a split of a 70-30 split between construction and design. Where we're at today is an actual uh, project budget at 49.972 million. Very, very close to the 50 million. I was able to shift a few more dollars into construction with the cost savings on design. I'm going to walk through very briefly the base bid with the alternatives. Base, the base bid on this project has different types of concrete for the roadway, the curb and gutter, crosswalks, the, um, the curb zone, and, and these transit areas. That was our base bid that we put together. Um, essentially, we have a, a jointing pattern for the entire nickel wall project that in concept looks like this with the different colored concrete and the different concrete materials. Base bid alternate one is for a tighter scoring pattern on the sidewalk. Alternate two is a stencil design. That's a process that's put onto the concrete surface after it, while it's curing to give a different look and feel. This is just a representative sample. This is not the final design of what it's going to look like. And then alternate number three uses uh, exposed aggregate in the concrete as well as different color rock in the concrete. This is primarily in the groves area where we're going to be putting this, this type of treatment into the concrete. Uh, Gene Kelly in our Civil Rights Department has been very helpful uh, to me on this project. We started off with some goals on the uh, Minority and Business Enterprise, the MBE, at 8%, and for Women in Business Enterprises, the WBE is at 11%. Our actual numbers on the, on the bid that we have in place is 39% Minority and Business Enterprise, and we are at the 11% for Women in Business Enterprise. So our goal was 8%, and we are delivering 39%. Our workforce goals are at 6% for women and 32% for minority. And this information we collect during construction and we monitor this as we go through the project. Um, the principles for the project have not changed. Even with some design changes and uh, changes after we received that first bid, we still have this a place for people, pedestrian friendly, elegant, durable, and cost-effective operation and maintenance. We did some modification to the design to turn it from in-place brick pavers to cast in place concrete. We were able to retain the raised intersections. This was a key piece for us in the design. It uh, allows for the intersections to be raised, allowing pedestrians to flow through, making them a priority. We have the audible pedestrian signals in place on this project, high contrast in the crosswalks, and we added bump outs to shorten the pedestrian crossings. We were able to keep our features in the project, like the groves, the light walk, which is a key piece to the design, is kept with the project. This is a day, daytime view of the, night, of the light walk, nighttime view of the light walk. We were able to keep a key feature of the art walk in place across the street from the light walk. Our lighting design system stayed in place. We have tall, elegant lighting that provides the uniform light to the project. Today our lights are, are low and there's hot spots and cold spots and the lights tend to shine in your eyes. With these new higher lights, it provides a uniform lighting across all the Nicollet Mall. And lastly, we were able to keep the key feature on the uh, north end of the reading room by the library. Looking ahead, utility Construction continues as we relocate utilities on Nicollet Mall. We are anticipating a construction start for the main roadway on or about June 1st of this year with substantial completion to the Nicollet Mall project in November of 2017 and final completion in May of 2018. That completes my presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Owen, and congratulations on on the, the bid process and, and ensuring so important parts of the uh, overall design were captured, retained, and now can be paid for. So thank you very much for your work on that and all of the staff that were involved. So we have a number of comments to be made, and I'm looking forward to Council Vice President Clinton's first. So this is a kind of more um, in the weeds. So anyway, I'll, I'll say I'm, I'm glad to see the information come back in a way that allows us to, to move forward. 
Um, I have <coughs> been receiving some questions about uh, what are the uh, special efforts that the city is making in combination with other departments such as civil rights to ensure that the um, goals, <laughs> workforce goals as well as subcontractor goals uh, uh, are met. And so uh, this is a very large project for the city of Minneapolis. Um, and uh, so I think there will be a lot of attention on what are the combined efforts that we are making to do our best to uh, secure compliance with those goals. Is that a, that's a question. That's a question, Mr. What efforts? Uh, yes, me, uh, how, effort? what oh. special efforts are we undertaking to ensure that we are going to get compliance with our workforce goals and subcontractor goals? That's a specific question. Yeah, I, um, yep. Mr. Chair, Councilmember Glidden, uh, working with our Civil Rights Department, we do ongoing monitoring during construction. We look at the uh, type of uh, workforce that's out on the job, not only by the prime contractor, but by the subs. So that is monitored through construction to make sure we are meeting those goals. So I think I was looking more for something more than what are our typical monitoring efforts. And maybe this, since I think we're not tracking right now, okay. usually for larger projects, I think we think about what are uh, the efforts that we need to undertake to ensure that we're able to, to meet those goals. Um, and how confident are we? Do we need to do special things or give special direction to our contractors to uh, ensure they are doing all that is possible to, to meet those goals? So I think that's a different question than asking what are our existing mechanisms within the city to complete uh, monitoring. I, I expect that's happening, okay. right? So yeah. this is about... Um, how we're going to comply with goals on one of the biggest and most high, pro high profile projects in the city of Minneapolis after the Viking Stadium. Okay, on, on some of the specifics, I will get back to you with those answers. I work with, with Gene, I know Gene has been with us every step of the way. Some of the things we've done is by dividing the project up into multiple bid packs. I think that helps us make it more attractive for multiple bidders to go at a job like this. And I think that was a good move on the city's part to do that when we took uh, a large single bid and split it out into multiple packages. It was an important thing to note. I re recall uh, we've all received letters from Hired Minnesota acknowledging uh, the ability of our city projects to uh, surpass those uh, rather ambitious goals for minority women-owned businesses. Um, and it is intentional. You have to put out ambitious uh, goals to have them uh, met. And we've been pleased to see that the city of Minneapolis has been able to achieve and surpass those goals along the way. So I know that's important uh, to everything we're doing, and especially as reported through the Civil Rights uh, Department in the Public Safety and Civil Rights Emergency Management Committee. I think Council President Johnson outlined or highlighted that for us in our last committee, and we could, should continue to monitor those to make sure that they're, we're surpassing those ambitious goals, not just meeting them. Uh, additional comments or questions? Councilmember Reich. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And yeah, my understanding is that uh, some of these ideas in terms of splitting out um, the bid process, these are ideas that were solicited from the developers who have done a good job. And we have definitely been employing those ideas. And I think that was one of the big moves. There might be smaller moves I'm not aware of, but I know all of this is coming out of consultation of those who have worked on projects in our city and have gotten the numbers done right. So I know that's a, a key piece and we'll track it very vigorously, as you can tell from the commentary today from council members. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you uh, for this presentation. I appreciate the concision. We've got a lot on our agenda today, a lot of conversation. Uh, but let's not confuse uh, being very concise with the importance of what was done. Um, oftentimes when a project's over budget, uh, we ha you have some tools. You can make the project smaller. You can go in and make the project less than what was being proposed to do. That wasn't really what you had, given that half of the money is coming from outside sources. Our immediate downtown property owners are contributing half and they had an expectation for that half met, and so we didn't want to open up that conversation in pursuit of trying to solve a budgetary issue. You went in with uh, those serious constraints and came up with something that actually works uh, by the determination of your department and obviously some creative thinking from our designers, so I guess they're getting their, uh, they're earning their paycheck as well. So I thank you for that, and uh, it, should be, it should be underscored the accomplishment and the significance of it given the scale of this project, so thanks. Thank you, Mr. Ellen. Oh, Councilmember Goodman. Um, 
Mr. Chair, Councilmember Glidden, I'm glad I'm here today because uh, Councilmember Fry and I serve on the implementation team for the Nicollet Mall project, and we would be happy to discuss this in our Nicollet Mall implementation team meeting. Um, we had not had a lengthy conversation about this because the first bid was just so overpriced we weren't sure if we were going to move forward. Um, breaking up the bids into smaller packages is a key component, not only for a lower bid, but to make it more manageable for the various contractors that bid on each piece. And you know, there's all of these issues with regard to insurance and indemnification that some of these smaller uh, companies have a hard time dealing with. So the smaller bid packages are, is a big step in the right direction, but we would be happy to discuss it. Our project manager, Peter Brown's here today, and I think it's worth discussing in the implementation team too. We just haven't even gotten to the point of knowing if we'd have a bid uh, to even consider, but I appreciate the question. We'll be on top of it. Good. Thank you all. So I'd like to move that item. Uh, any uh, further discussion or comments? Not seeing any. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? That item carries. Thank you again, Mr. Elwood, Mr. Brown, everyone for being involved and being available for this presentation. I think the uh, next item is our uh, continuing conversation that we're having on the 20-year neighborhood uh, park plan resolution. Um, this was, of course, brought forward uh, through the Committee of the Whole and referred to this committee uh, for future action. And uh, in the last couple of cycles, we've addressed components of the, uh, uh, of the park planning process, understanding our financial uh, situation at the present and what we can be looking forward to. So we've done a lot of looking, everything from the fourth quarter numbers uh, moving forward. Uh, and then uh, there's been a ongoing efforts to find a, a, some sort of deal, if we could, that uh, reconciles what uh, the mayor um, has had expressed very uh, clearly in her uh, veto of this from the uh, park board's point of view, which was to make sure that there was a street component included in this overall package and that it included a, a reliable and um, accountable funding stream for it, and it was part of our annual budget process. And I think the uh, resolution uh, that we're uh, able to forward today for consideration uh, addresses those concerns, and there's gonna be a lot more information and questions. I think at the last meeting uh, of this committee, we had a staff direction from Council Member uh, Glidden on the issue of sales taxes. So I'm not sure where we're gonna handle this in terms of the presentation. Okay, we can do that. Uh, let's do it second. Right, let's do it now. That's, that helps put us in position for understanding uh, our financial position going forward. So let's deal with the staff direction first and then we'll be making sure that a substitute um, resolution is in front of uh, committee members and available for review and uh, a special attention to the uh, presentation mm -hmm. that Mr. Ruff will be joining and presenting right after that. So let's begin with Ms. Christensen on the staff direction question about the issue of sales taxes. Thank you, Chair Quincy and members of the committee um, and other council members here today. Uh, as you articulated, part of the context for your ongoing discussion regarding funding for streets and parks is going to be um, incorporating some of the resources that are currently utilized by the city for its other functions one of which is the local sales and hospitality taxes. And in response to Council Vice President's staff direction from the last Ways and Means Committee meeting, I am presenting that information to you today. As part of the staff direction, staff was asked to return with a description of the legal uses of the sales taxes under the current state law, provide a description of projected sales tax proceeds for the next 20 years, and to show you a report with the current plans for debt service and finance plan payments for various uses, including the convention center, target center, the Viking stadium, and comparing this to the local sales tax receipts that we currently receive and those that are projected. And then finally, to uh, propose to you a mechanism for uh, relaying this information on a regular basis. As we look at the local sales taxes, local sales and hospitality taxes, it's important to uh, provide the uh, council members as well as the public with a summary of the various local sales taxes. We tend to lump them together as we speak about them uh, as it relates to their ability to fund various activities in the city. But it, you should know that it is comprised of a number of different um, components. There is a, an entertainment tax portion that's 3%. 
And that is um, a little outside the, um, the parameters and restrictions of the remaining local sales and hospitality taxes. There's Minneapolis lodging tax at 2.625%. There is liquor and restaurant taxes of 3%. And then there's also a sales and use tax for all taxable purchases within the city. And for your reference, uh, the uh, criteria for when, how, and in which area these various taxes are charged are a little bit complex and complicated. So with the agenda item, uh, online as well as the materials that are prepared for you today. There is um, the summary by the Minnesota Department of Revenue which walks through the um, various circumstances under which these taxes are charged. And this slide uh, is a very um, small summary of the, um, the stacking which may occur with the um, implementation and uh, various taxes that are charged, including starting on the far left, the base Minnesota state sales taxes and adding on the liquor taxes, which again is a state of Minnesota tax. There's also the transit improvement tax and the um, Hennepin County tax. These are all charged uh, before we start to contemplate what uh, local sales and hospitality taxes are subject to uh, Minneapolis revenues. We have the Minneapolis sales and use tax, the half of a percent applied to all uh, taxable sales. We also then have on top of that, the lodging tax, Minneapolis liquor tax, the restaurant tax, and then the entertainment tax, which you will see crosses a wide uh, range of activities within the city. Uh, so for your um, information, just so you get some context as to uh, how the various activities in the city are taxed and the magnitude of which they are um, taxed. Yes, that's uh, who, who needs that? Is it Council President Johnson? Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. um, thank you. And I'm sorry, I don't have a little word thing. Um, so, Ms. Christensen, the final thing there so the restaurant, no entertainment at 7.75 is 7.775% of the total sales taxes we collect? Is that the proportion? It, it, is, it is the um, proportional amount charged on top of the actual cost of the, the meal. So this would, if you purchased a meal, you would be paying then a 7.775% oh. tax on top of that. So okay. this is merely um, portraying you. for you the calculation. I get it, okay. So as I noted with the um, slide prior to this, the uh, starting from the left side, there are sales taxes that are charged on behalf of the state of Minnesota before we implement any of the local sales taxes. And with that, I think it's important to just give you a brief overview of the um, amount of regular sales taxes that are generated in the city of Minneapolis, which are then submitted to uh, the state of Minnesota for its uh, various uh, funding needs. So you'll see beginning in 2010, there was $3.3 billion of um, taxes, general sales taxes, including the liquor tax that was collected in Minnesota cities and submitted to the state of Minnesota. And I do note when I uh, mentioned the collected in Minnesota cities, these totals do not reflect taxes that are collected in unincorporated areas, nor does it reflect taxes that are submitted by vendors, uh, online sales uh, from out of state. So you'll see that of the $3.3 billion in 2010, $486 million of that was submitted by the city of Minneapolis to the state. 209 million by St. Paul and 187 million dollars by uh, the city of Bloomington. So you'll see that over the course of many years that the average um, uh, contribution of all of the sales taxes collected in Minnesota cities sent to the state is approximately 14.7 uh, percent, about 15 percent of all the sales taxes that are submitted by cities to the state come from Minneapolis. Going back to the um, requested information from the staff direction, the uh, legal uses of the local sales and hospitality taxes, notwithstanding the entertainment taxes, which do not fall on, into these categories, the uh, uh, identified excess in any year of the city's one half percent sales and use tax, the liquor, lodging, and restaurant taxes, again, not including the entertainment taxes, can be used for the following purposes capital projects for residential, cultural, 
commercial and economic development in both downtown Minneapolis and the Minneapolis neighborhoods, and to fund other city expenditures in support of the basketball arena, other capital projects, or for other economic development provided that the city may direct excess revenue first to convention center debt, operations, capital improvements, and marketing. And again, the utilization of these funds in the two bold bullets that you see before you is after stadium convention center and existing target center debt uses. And Ms. Christensen, before you continue um, or end, <laughs> I just wanted to point out to members that I've, I've started a speaker management because it's a difficult for me to see some people. So if you'd like to join in speaker management, you may do so, but if you still need to get my attention with the red tag, we're good. Thank you, Ms. Christensen. Sorry to interrupt, but please continue. Following the adoption of the updated legislation relating to local sales taxes, the city went through an exercise as part of its budget process to identify what we would call the, a waterfall or, uh, or a, a list of priorities or uh, the type of activities that the city uh, would propose using any excess local taxes for. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Council Vice President Glenn. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to go back to that description on kind of what's our legal authority. Um, just because, um, you know, there's this phrase that we can use it for, for some other as defined purposes, which are actually sound pretty broad. Um, after stadium, convention center, and target center debt. And so I guess my question is uh, more just one of interpretation, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in how we're able to use any excess after those debt service uh, payments are made. So, because I guess one interpretation could be you have a plan and you're funding the plan and then what you get in excess of the plan could be used for these other defined purposes but there could be other interpretations of what does it mean to pay that off. And I just didn't know um, if there was any additional, if we're kind of just using our best uh, uh, abilities to interpret that, mm -hmm. um, or if there's any more guidance you can give us or Ms. Trammell could give us on how we're looking at what's needed to interpret uh, that direction from the state. Uh, Chair Quincy, Council Vice President Glidden, I am not conversant in uh, opining on whether or not the excess is after the total defeasance of all of the outstanding debt or if it is part of an identified long-term financing plan in which we believe strongly that we have sufficient funding on an annual basis that may result in excess on an annual basis. Um, I apologize, I'm not conversant with that. All right. Well, that's why I asked if Ms. Trammell had any thoughts or. Ms. Trammell. Chair Quincy, Council Member Glidden. The first thing that we would do is review the plain language of that uh, statute or session law. And it says provided the city may direct. And so um, it being may direct, that appears to give us a little more leeway mm -hmm. than a shall direct. Um, and um, without looking at the whole rest of the session, law, I could, which I could do, um, that's where I would start. Thank you. And I just, that was part of what I was hoping would be brought out here because um, it does seem like the, the strict language gives us some flexibility by the choice of, of words in there. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I wanted to ask that question of our professional staff on how we're looking at that. Thank you, Ms. Christensen. And, you know, sequencing is important too because we do not collect these taxes. These are collected by retailers and then returned to the state. So when does the state give it uh, back to the city for our use? And when can we make those choices? How often? Uh, Chair Quincy, the uh, state remits uh, our proportional piece of the local taxes on a monthly basis. There's actually about a two month lag because of the vendors reporting to the state, the state then reconciling and then uh, remitting um, our portion to us on a monthly basis. <laughs> As part of the long-term planning for the potential use of any excess uh, sales tax proceeds, the city, uh, as part of its budget process, uh, I believe it was in 2013, 
incorporated uh, a series of priority um, uses for which the local sales taxes may be eligible. And these have been adopted or readopted on an annual basis as part of the city's uh, annual budget process through the city's financial policies. And again, uh, I will read through these for the benefit of the um, audience that uh, these are not necessarily in priority order. However, the uh, excesses in local taxes may be used for the payment of debt service obligations on the city's convention center. Operational support of the city's convention center inclusive, inclusive of maintenance, service, and marketing agreements. For baseline capital projects and maintenance at city facilities as allowed by law, including both the convention center and target center. For establishment of reserves in a tax stabilization account to smooth changes in taxes levy. For infrastructure needs that promote economic development. For economic development related public safety needs. For discretionary capital projects at the convention center and target center, and finally other needs as determined by the city. Thank you, Ms. Christensen. Um, so, Vice President. Thank you. I just wanted to know if we know when that uh, policy was developed. I see that it was readapted as mm -hmm. part of our last budget, but since it doesn't mention the Viking Stadium, I'm assuming this might have been an older policy, but I could be wrong. So, or did we develop it uh, updated at a certain point? Uh, Chair Quincy, Council Vice President Glidden, it was actually done after the um, legislation enabling the use for the Viking Stadium, and I believe that was uh, 2000 and for the 2013 budget. Mm -hmm. So it was the end of calendar year 2012. So then how do the payments we have agreed to make to support the Viking Stadium, how, how do those happen? Isn't that us receiving the sales taxes and then redirecting just like we do for the target center or the convention center? Or is there some something direct that happens from the state level to direct those funds so we don't need to mention it in our policy? Uh, Chair Quincy, Council Vice President Glidden, the latter, and I will address that in a later slide regarding okay. the um, uses against the uh, projected proceeds. Thank you. As part of the staff direction, we were asked to return with a history of the collection of the local uh, sales taxes. And before you see um, fairly clearly the transition between the prior use of the local taxes versus what was um, provided for in the enabling legislation. So you'll see that in 2012 and in 2013, this local sales and use taxes largely were um, provided to directly to the convention center for related activities, including debt service, capital, and operating and marketing activities. And in, so you'll see in 2012, the entertainment taxes were the only source of local taxes that were um, allowed or uh, allocated for general fund use. And remember, entertainment taxes are the one type that don't fit into the overall uh, legislation regarding um, the local taxes. The same is true in 2013, but it, then if you look in 2014 as part of the, uh, the budget process, we recognize the shift in the eligibility of the uses for the local taxes by shifting the corresponding uh, revenues from the convention center to the general fund. So if you compare $32.6 million in local sales and use taxes in 2013 relating to the convention center, that's that middle section, is now reflected in the general fund uh, under 2014. And uh, that follows through into subsequent years. I also want to draw your attention to um, near the bottom, there's a, uh, a line item that uh, indicates entertainment taxes that are allocated to the arena or the target center, and that is largely reflective of an estimate of the entertainment taxes generated by ticket sales at that venue. So to recap the historical uses of the local sales and hospitality taxes, again, prior to the updated legislation, is for convention center debt, uh, about 50 to $56 million for debt operations, uh, including the Meet Minneapolis function and capital improvements. Also for Target Center, about $2 million, and that's largely for capital and operations, and that reflects 
largely that, that bottom line that I just mentioned to you. And then the entertainment taxes not utilized for target center within eligible uses for um, general type activities and incorporated in the general fund. So when we look at the 2016 budget, we see how we've incorporated uh, kind of a continuance of the same type of activity, about $50 million that's used for convention center support, including debt service, operations and marketing and capital improvements. There's about $3 million uh, allocated to Target Center for capital and operations and uh, the beginning of the debt service associated with the renovations. As you recall, we just entered into the financing mechanism. So 2016 is only a partial year of the um, obligation for the debt service for that um, bond issue. And in the 2016 budget, approximately $23 million of the overall collection or estimated collection of local taxes is allocated for general fund use. Go ahead, Council Mr. Pike. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Chair. I wanted to go back to the Target Center for a second because um, we are also funding some uh, debt service through some other sources, I believe such as, and I always get these names mixed up, but the Common Project. Um, so I would like you to please talk about that and whether we still need to finish that funding and whether this sales tax is essentially funding additional um, uh, debt service that has now come into play on top of what was anticipated at the time the Common Project uh, came into play or how all that works because I know there are a lot of questions about what are we already paying for are we sort mm -hmm. of counting things twice or once or what what's going on uh, chair Quincy council vice president Glidden the um, existing debt on target center is primarily funded with a combination of uh, consolidated TIF funding that is the source that is shared with the um, neighborhood and community relations activities, as well as funding from the city's common project TIF district. Between the two of them, uh, largely the um, debt service is funded. We know that there, uh, the timing of some of the revenues associated with these TIF districts does not one-to-one -one correlate with the timing of the payoff of the um, bonds. So, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but I mm -hmm. just want some clarification. Mm -hmm. This, what those TIF projects mm -hmm. were helping to pay off is essentially the remaining debt service from when the city purchased, mm -hmm. uh, took over essentially ownership responsibility for the Target Center, which was in the 90s. Am I am I understanding that right? I just, Chair Quincy, Council Vice President Clinton, that's that's correct. It was existing debt service, nothing new. Okay, thank you. And again, I just, mm -hmm. I hate to interrupt, but I think we've, right. um, these end up being big obligations and making sure we're clear on kind of where they stemmed from and kind of how we're adding to that is important. And I think that also kind of explains what you're about to say about the uh, kind of the reserves that we needed to collect uh, because the bond sales go, or the bond debt continues, whereas the, our ability to collect on that uh, TIF project I think it's like a two-year gap. So we have to build up a certain funding reserve so we can pay that debt back. Chair Quincy, that's correct. The, um, there will be um, several years, I think you're correct, with the two years of collections that won't be fully spent, but we need that to pay the um, following years of debt service.